Good afternoon and welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Lolly. Joining us today is Mr. Mark Cohen. Mark is the CEO of Legal Mosaic and the executive chairman of Digital Legal Exchange. He's also an author and contributor to various journals, including Forbes. Mark has also lectured at Harvard, Oxford, UCL, IE, and several other leading global institutions. Welcome to the show, Mark. My pleasure to be here with you, Lolly. Well, Mark, it's 6 a.m. here in Singapore, so if I were to yawn at any point in time, it is me, not you, all right? I'm glad to know that, and I appreciate you getting up so early. Now, Mark, in addition to the accolades that I had just mentioned, you are also a critical player in the legal scene of Singapore, because since 2018, you have been our catalyst in residence at the Singapore's Academy of Law. Tell us, what does a catalyst in residence do? That's a really great question. Uh, and I wish I could say that I was the one who suggested that title, but it was the Singapore Academy of Law. I guess in plain terms, a catalyst is someone who makes things happen or participates in group activities that result in things happening. Um, and so when the Singapore Academy of Law approached me back in 2018 to consider a role, um, you know, they had in mind some things. And one of the things that they had, I think, was to get um, someone who had a uh, long and somewhat global familiarity um, with the legal industry, um, how it intersects with business, how it intersects with technology. Um, and, um, you know, to sort of take a very fresh, no holds barred um, review of some of the initiatives that Singapore was engaged in um, with an eye towards providing um, constructively critical counsel. Now, you know, a couple of months back, I saw this uh, blaring headline talking about technology, legal tech in Singapore. I saw this blaring headline about Singapore being the shining light for legal technology in Asia. But I think if you go to the street, if you talk to the man on the street, um, we will not be too convinced. And the reason is, I think that, you know, any kind of technological advancement have to bring the entire population along with it. And the people on the street are feeling a little left out because there is no relevance shown to us with regards to the new gadgets, the new technology that all the, the lawyers and the judges get to utilize. Um, are they passing off on the cost savings? Are they passing on the time savings? What I'm trying to say is that um, it means very little to the men on the street if we're not shown to benefit too from all these legal innovations. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, whether it's the, the, the man on the street or the woman on the street or whether it's a very large company, um, for technology to um, uh, be um, material, it has to have a use case. That is to say, it's got to be used and applied to solve a problem or to um, make uh, a particular process more efficient for the benefit of the ultimate consumer. So uh, I come from a background of uh, trial law. Some evidence never even sees the light of day because it is not material, it's not relevant to the matter at hand. I think that so much of technology is the same. Um, if there is really no use case, then what, what purpose does it serve? If it is so complicated that users are, um, you know, absolutely you know, timid about the very prospect of trying to learn it, it has very little utility. Um, so I would say in terms of being able to convince the man in the street as to the importance of technology, I would start by saying by using this piece of technology or adopting this app, it will help you to fill in the blank. And I could give you many examples of filling in the blank that have made a real difference for people around the world. In, in recent times, particularly, I think, um, since COVID, which is really serving to accelerate uh, change, um, you know, in, in ways that I think are very daunting. But ultimately, I do think that some good things can and will come out of it. 
Well, let me, let me allow me to give an example of a blank that has not been filled. For example, back in 2013, seven years ago, Singapore allows for law firms to utilize e-litigation, -lit e electronic litigations, to do their filing from the comfort, the ease and the rapidity of their computers. Um, but such a service is denied to the litigants in person. In other words, today, if you are not represented, this is the process you have to go through. You have to type out your affidavit. You have to collate your evidence. You have to print it up. You bring it to the human commissioner. You get his manual signature. You get his manual stamp. You scan the whole darn thing and you, you take it to one of two filing bureaus in Singapore. Get in line for two to three hours and maybe then and only then do you get to do the same thing as lawyers get to do from their computer. So this is why I raise my concern is that you know, is all this legal innovation going to benefit just a small segment of the population, just the legal industry, or is this also going to translate into time and cost savings for the man on the street? Well, now we're talking really more about economic issues, I think, because certainly the potential is there for technological tools to serve, uh, better serve uh, the man in the street. Uh, that capability is there. Uh, it's being applied in other jurisdictions. I think part of the problem is that um, law has always um, thrived on um, its artisanal approach to things, um, on uh, the fact that lawyers would claim that no two cases are alike, um, and that it's very labor intensive, uh, and that ultimately it's not so much the result um, or you know the outcome, but it's the input, the amount of work that was put into it, and whether lawyers, not customers, think that you know they have done a, a really good job. Um, now, business, as we know, operates just an, a, a, an opposite uh, set of metrics. That is to say, for business to be successful, it must be customer centric it must be accessible, it must be efficient, it must be competitive, and it must be looking for ways to constantly improve customer access, satisfaction, and experience. So uh, I would argue that um, it would be a very positive thing if lawyers who are in the so-called retail segment of the legal world that is to say, not corporation lawyers representing large corporations, but rather lawyers who are representing the man on the street. The problem is that most men on the street can't afford lawyers in the first instance because those lawyers are not themselves making use of the tools that are available. And I'll go one step farther. There are a lot of lawyers who say, yes, but technology is inimical to my well-being financially. If I start being able to do something in 10 minutes that I used to spend an hour on, well then look at all the money I'm losing. I would flip that around and say that if you could do it in 10 minutes, you could lower your price um, and you could service that many more people that much more effectively. And by the way, you could get other people to do a lot of the machine work, and you would be liberating to do the very activities that you thought or hoped you would be doing when you graduated from law school, instead of doing grunt work. So I think that what it really requires, in my mind, Lily, is an explanation, making a case both to the lawyer as well as to the man on the street. And I think it's just really a question of aligning the interests of the two, because surely the tools are there for law to do a whole lot better and for customers in turn to have a whole lot better view of lawyers. You know, that's interesting. You should mention that because I, I feel that as a consumer looking at a lawyer, the legal industry does not behave in a manner typical of other industries. For example, with other businesses, we as the consumers were the one to rate the service that we have received. So take, for example, Grab, which is the, the local Uber. You know, at the end of a trip, I will rate the driver. 
um, if I were to order food service delivery half an hour after delivery, they will invite me to comment on the food that I have tasted. And that kind of feedback is invaluable to the next customer in his or her decision making. But when it comes to the legal industry, I see very little, very few feedback mechanisms available. What are your well, thoughts on that? I completely agree with you. And I will tell you that 13 years ago, when I co-founded this company called Clearspire, we were looking at that. And that was before Uber ever came into existence. And we thought to ourselves, how can we um, both internally rate the efficiency and the success with clients of our lawyers internally? And then how can we in turn uh, gather data on how our clients perceive the lawyer's performance? That is how we're going to uh, gauge effectiveness. That was 13 years ago. Um, fast forward to the present. There are certainly platforms, there are tools that are available. And this raises another point, Lily, which is I think that law can and must do a better job of borrowing from other industries. Part of the reason it doesn't is because historically it has operated as a kind of an island or fiefdom or guild unto itself. Uh, but in today's world, it's not just about legal expertise. It's also about business expertise. It's about technological expertise. It's about using technology to um, achieve uh, efficient, effective scale. Um, and it's about all these other things of which legal expertise is just one ingredient. It is not the entire dinner. Um, and so um, for all those reasons, um, there are people out there um, who are working hard um, to bring these kinds of ultimately mindsets um, to uh, the delivery of legal services, whether they're for the man or woman in the street or whether they're for the Tomasics of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I, um, I, I have actually um, seen competitions calling for ranking of law firms. It's just that uh, the input doesn't come just from the public, it actually comes from the law firms themselves. I'm not sure how authentic those kind of rankings are if the lawyers get to rank themselves. And it, it's a bit bizarre to me because it seems that lawyers are the only professionals that rate themselves. So I'm very glad to hear from you that even since 13 years ago, there's been efforts to put feedback mechanisms available because those kind of things will truly empower customers in their decision making. I say all the time, how is it that, you know, I have more information in terms of getting into an Uber or whatever the, the, the ride hailing service might be. Or if I want to um, uh, lease an apartment, I want to go, you know, to um, Germany. And instead of staying in a hotel, I want to stay in an Airbnb. In matter of moments, I can get all sorts of reviews. I have all sorts of information. I know exactly what to expect and what others say, whether or not my expectations met their experiences. And yet, you know, having uh, been a bet the company uh, trial lawyer for the first 30 years of my career, um, people just went on the fact that, well, you know, other people would say, hey, Mark's a really good lawyer but there was no data to back it up. And I knew lots of lawyers who, you know, were really quite poor in terms of what their trial skills were. And yet they were perceived as great lawyers. Um, you know, if, if, if you can do that getting into a ride hailing service, I've got to believe that you should be able to do it getting a lawyer. And just one more thing to add to it. Um, a few years ago, I had a, a serious health issue which very happily has resolved itself completely. And, and, and uh, it's, it's long in my uh, rear view mirror. I raise it for this purpose. Um, when I was initially given the diagnosis, I was looking for every piece of data that I could possibly find in terms of what the best places to go were, who were the people who had conducted the most procedures of this kind, what were their results? I was looking for data, much the same way the CEO of a company 
is going to be looking for data. I often say that lawyers, uh, how many times have you heard a lawyer say, my nose tells me this or my gut tells me that? You tell that to a business person and they think it's comical. Um, we, should, we should not be rendering advice by our anatomical parts. Save that for other things. We should be doing it on the basis of data and our prospective customers, and I use the word customer very intentionally, our customers should have access to that data too before they decide whether or not to engage a particular lawyer. So Amit, um, why do you think the law industry has been so slow when it comes to adoption of technology? Technology. I don't know if you were here at a tech law conference last year. I believe you were. I think I saw your name on the list. Uh, but I recall this uh, demo that our law minister Shamugam showcased to the audience. In his demo, he pitted 20 highly experienced lawyers against artificial intelligence to review five identical contracts. It took the lawyers 92 minutes and it took AI just 26 seconds, not even half a minute and with far less errors than the lawyers incurred. So it was evident that you know, legal tech has a vital role to play in the industry. But why has the industry been so slow and resistant when it comes to adoption of technology? If you look at travel, if you look at medicine, you look at retail, you look at banking, you look at finance, even property, real estate, they seem to have left the legal industry in the dust when it comes to tech adoption. Could you explain that resistance, please? Sure. Well, I think there are several reasons. Uh, one is legal culture. Remember that for a very long time, um, lawyers sold one thing and one thing alone, and that was legal expertise. Um, and they were the only ones that had it. And um, in fact, it, you know, up until the last 25, 30 years ago, um, unless you were a lawyer, you couldn't get into most law libraries. Um, and so it was not only the legal expertise, but it was the access to the source materials. Um, okay, so one thing is that lawyers have long had a monopoly um, and their whole economic model, their entire modus operandi has been built around that monopoly. Um, now, um, and that monopoly, of course, says that the more input I have, the more time I spend, the more I'm going to be rewarded, regardless of what the output of that time is. Um, so part of it is clearly economics. I think uh, another part of it is the fact that um, a lot of lawyers feel that um, Technology is, you know, if they had wanted to study technology, if they were interested in data and science, they would have gone to medical school. Um, but they ended up going to law school because it was, you know, a lot more, you know, sort of uh, talk. Um, and I find that really, you know, somewhat ironic because as a trial lawyer, it's not about talk and supposition, it's about evidence and how you can prove things. So, uh, and the other thing is, I, I often cite the example of, you know, why is it, do you think, and of course I'm asking you rhetorically, why is it that you think if, if you talk to most any lawyer, she or he is going to have a smartphone, um, they're going to use all sorts of apps, they're going to take the same ride hailing service that you do, um, they're going to perhaps go uh, use Airbnb on a vacation, so they are not, you know, complete tech Luddites in their personal lives. And yet in their professional lives, knowing that technology, you know, can have many very positive consequences, why is it that, you know, in their professional lives, they choose to resist it? And I, I think sadly, it's, it's, it's very much a question of, you know, we don't need technology or it requires our particular brand of expertise or it's going to make me redundant in the end. And I would argue to that it's, you will become as a lawyer redundant in the next few years if you don't adopt technology, if you don't understand what its potential is and more significantly, you go beyond just basic legal expertise 
and you start learning other skills. Because lawyers in the next few years are going to function very differently, most of them, than when I was a baby lawyer. I think you just called out the F elephant in the room right there. I think it's their fear of uh, redundancy, their insecurity about their jobs. Because I recall this webinar that you and Richard Soskin did at the Tech Law Fest this year, a lot of the questions that came from the audience had to do with the lawyers, their livelihood, their insecurity about their jobs. But you know, have we gone so far away from the meaning of law that we have forgotten that laws were not erected to provide jobs for the lawyers. The laws were erected to provide empowerment, restoration and protection for the people. How can we reinstill this value into the lawyers? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and I think one way is through a um, open and, and, and uh, competitive marketplace. Um, and I think you're beginning to see that. Um, you're beginning to see law companies who do not necessarily engage in the practice of law, but who are very, very adept in uh, delivering efficient, effective, um, uh, 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 cost efficient and valuable um, services. Um, and they're able to do it quickly, predictably, um, and at scale. Um, a couple examples from the states. Um, Legal Zoom is a well-known company um, that started out as a legal document company and now it does much more. Um, there's a young fellow who is a computer science whiz. I first met him when he was a sophomore at Stanford University. Um, he wasn't studying law, he was studying computer science, but he was kind of musing about many of the questions that you asked me. Why is law so resistant to technology? Why can't technology be used? And he started um, a suite of apps called Do Not Pay. Uh, it's now mushroomed in there about a hundred different apps that actually can be used with the click of a button to solve real life problems. So for example, he did an app right after COVID uh, hit, um, which allowed people to, um, you know, be able in all 50 states in the states um, to be able to um, somehow navigate through the very complex um, forms for unemployment insurance. Um, these are real life tools um, that, you know, are not going to replace lawyers, but are certainly going to make certain types of widespread legal issues uh, more readily resolvable and at scale. Um, and certainly the potential, and I know Richard talked a lot about remote courts, something that you adverted to at the beginning of our conversation. There's certainly a potential for that as well. Not just you know, having courts as a place where people go with robes and in England, you know, wigs, um, but uh, courts are more of a process. And there are places now where courts are starting to um, use technology to allow people who cannot afford law but need legal services to be able to have access to self-help tools um, and to be able to, you know, uh, without either side hiring a lawyer, um, be able to, you know, tap into things that will let people know, here's the law, see if you can solve this yourself. Because not all disputes require lawyers. In fact, I would argue that far, far fewer uh, disputes than most people would imagine do not require lawyers and could yeah. readily be resolved either by the parties between themselves or with resort to other tools. Yeah, along with that, uh, one of the catchphrases that's been buzzing around in the legal scene, not just in Singapore, but glo uh, globally, is access to justice. And um, before I tap your brains on how legal tech can bridge this gap between the law and the legal needs of the people, could you share with us very quickly how policymakers have been attempting to address this issue? Well, they've been doing it in different ways. Uh, Singapore, I know uh, the access to justice crisis there, though it certainly exists. And um, I don't have any hard data, but I've been told uh, by reliable sources that the uh, about 30% of the population in Singapore who would um, you know, want or need access to legal services 
effectively are denied them because they simply cannot afford them. Um, hopefully that is going to be further reduced. But to you know, contrast that with the United States and the UK is pretty much in the same uh, zip code on this. In the United States, 85% of all Americans who are in need of legal services, they're going to be evicted. Um, you know, they, 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 they want to be able to avail themselves of a fundamental constitutional slash legal right, but can't because they don't have a lawyer or can't afford one. 85% um, of Americans can't afford a lawyer. Um, and two thirds of all American businesses when confronted with serious legal issues can't afford a lawyer. That is a true tragedy. Um, and that really speaks to the fact that the legal profession can and must do better. And the tools exist. Um, and to your question of the regulators, unfortunately in the United States, for example, the American Bar Association uh, which in effect oversees the state bars that set you know, the particular practice rules has really, um, I, I think, been very hollow and has taken some cosmetic steps to try to address access to justice. But as lawyers would say, um, the matter speaks for itself. You know, the statistics I cited um, are really abysmal and shocking. Um, and it, it, by the way, it's also, you know, very detrimental to um, a democracy. How can people have um, faith in the rule of law if, you know, the, the law is not accessible to them even when they need it? Um, and so um, I think that, you know, regulators can and must play an important role in the UK. For example, there was what I would call a re-regulation, not deregulation but a re-regulation that liberalized um, you know, various regulations that had formally prohibited a non-lawyer ownership management in um, uh, organizations that provide legal services. Um, these are the kinds of things I think that are necessary. I'm really all in favor of a marketplace. That's not to say that you, 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 you abandon any protection of the public from charlatans, but at the same time, you have to weigh, you know, the protecting the public from the fact that the current rules are preventing the public. So you can't protect them if you've already effectively, you know, prevented them from being able to get access to services. So I think that regulators must play a, a role in this process. So must the judiciary, so must lawyers themselves. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. Unfortunately, our time is up and I still have questions that I want to pick your brains off. I think we might have to have you back for another show if, if your schedule allows. I would be delighted. Thank you so much, because I hate to squeeze in all the critical points. I think these are issues that need to be addressed. So thank you so much, Mark. I know it's near your bedtime <laughs> and uh, I commend you for the amazing work that you are doing. I think what you're doing is going to bring um, make a tremendous difference to people beyond your state, your town and your country and your efforts, your mission to design a system that work more effectively for more people is truly an honorable one. So yeah. I wish you all the success there is and I look forward to seeing you back on another show. I'll look forward to it, Lily. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.